path to a sustainable future. We will explore how green skills and green jobs actually need to lead into the future. And we have with us national perspectives, but also civil society perspectives, donor perspectives, and fortunately also a voice of the young. Before we go into the depth of the matter, I would like to thank particularly Dubai Cares for making all of this happen, the Rewired Summit, and also the programs that we will hear about today. And I would like to announce our first speaker who will join us via video statement, who is no one but the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon. He is also the co-chair of the Ban Ki-moon Center. So please, let's listen to Ban Ki-moon. Dear hosts, dear guests and global citizens, I'm honored to welcome you today on Education Day to the Rewired Summit 2023. Together with our distinguished partner, Dubai Cares, we believe in the impact of transformative education and green economy for a sustainable future. Because we share a hope, young change makers, we want to equip young change makers with the best possible tools. The Ban Ki-moon Center worked with unbounded associates and Plan International to provide young learners with a platform to explore how they can play a pivotal role through education in green jobs. We all need to be part of the transition towards a more sustainable world. That is why it fills me with immense joy to launch the Your Future in Green Jobs online course today. This course, inspired by the latest insights on young people and green skills, seeks to equip global youth with the knowledge and confidence to navigate the landscape of green jobs and climate action. And today's launch is not just an announcement. It's a call to action, a testament of our shared commitment to addressing the climate crisis while fostering opportunities for youth, the future of our planet. Thank you to our panelists and audience for joining us today and being part of this transformative journey and building a bridge between education and climate action. Greetings from Seoul. Thank you. Shukran Jajilam. Danke Shen. Big thanks to Ban Ki-moon for his remarks. It is now my privilege to announce to you Irina Bokova, the former Director General of UNESCO, who will also address us with welcome statements. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Monica. Um, thank you to Dubai Cares uh, uh, for this wonderful opportunity. And I'm a proud member of the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizenship. Uh, and I think uh, listening uh, once again to the great leader uh, Mr. Ban Ki-moon uh, is not just an enormous pleasure, but it's an inspiration. Because let me just remind that it was under his leadership that the United Nations and the world adopted Agenda 2030 for sustainable development and the Paris Climate Agreement. And I have always thought that these two agendas, in fact, are one single agenda. And this is what we are talking right now. Briefly, three things. Listening this morning to the very inspirational opening, I was thinking that still there are millions of people out there who do not have access to education. Children and more than 800 million illiterate people. This is the unfinished business that we have to once again take into account and not leave them outside. Number two is the mission for seven. As this morning, Professor Jeffrey Sachs was very eloquently explaining, which is the heart of the uh, Sustainable Development Agenda 2030. It is about the purpose of education, and this is directly linked to our debate now. It is about education for sustainable development. It is education for living together. It is education for human rights. It is education for caring about the planet. And I think this should be once again at the heart. And now I'm coming to the debate 
right now about the skills and what is needed also for the future. We know that the green transition needs skilled young people. We know also that with technology, with the artificial intelligence and other that is coming, the uh, OECD uh, conservatively estimates that until the end of this uh, decade, there will be more than one billion jobs lost. But many more others will be created, and most of them will be green jobs. And that is why I believe it is so important that we look and we put the dots together between education and climate in order to move to today's uh, debate. And I will end with the words of the Secretary General at the time, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, when I was listening to him, I remembered what he said at those times. We do not have planet B, we just have planet A, and we have to keep this in mind. Thank you and good luck. Thank you, Irina Bokova. Dear audience, let me introduce you to our fantastic panel here today. We have His Excellency Rosieli Suarez, State Secretary of Education of the State of Para, former Minister of Education, Brazil. We have His Excellency Miguel Sedov, Minister of Education, Science and Technology of the province of Misiones, Argentina. We have Sharon Armstrong, Director General of Social Development and Global Affairs, Canada. And we also are uh, pleasant, uh, pleasantly presented <laughs> with Kathleen Shervin, Chief Strategy and Engagement Officer of Plan International. And last but by no means least, Latifa al Noaimi, the Yango Green Jobs Working Group representative, who is herself a sustainable and renewable energy engineer. These experts all share a specific vantage point on which green jobs and which green skills are needed. And I want to turn to them immediately for the statement of central concern. What do they want you to know about their national positioning, about a donor perspective, about civil society perspective, and about the young perspective? So, dear minister, let me turn to you first. How would you describe the national position of Argentina when it comes to green jobs and doing something for it? <coughs> Thanks for the, the invitation. I, I speak in Spanish uh, for more, uh, uh, more easy for me. Uh, in Argentina, nosotros trabajamos mucho en lo relacionado con la educación ambiental y en particular mi provincia es una de las provincias más pequeñas del país, pero tiene el 52% de la biodiversidad de todo el país solamente en nuestra provincia de Misiones. Tal vez alguien conozca las cataratas del Iguazú, de Iguazú Falls, está en nuestra provincia. Entonces, eh, nuestra idea hace mucho tiempo ha sido trabajar la educación ambiental como un cambio de mindset, un cambio de conciencia ambiental de los estudiantes. Creemos que la única manera en que los estudiantes, los, los chicos puedan eh, tener una idea de qué es el futuro verde es que la escuela, desde el nivel inicial, el nivel primario, desde que son muy pequeños, tengan contenidos transversales de educación ambiental. Creemos que de esa manera no se trata solamente de explicar como si fuera eh, los ríos de, de Europa, sino de entender que todo el contenido educativo está traspasado por esa perspectiva ambiental. Con esa idea creemos que los jóvenes en 10, 20 años van a tener claramente establecido como uno de sus principios de vida la defensa del medio ambiente y la idea de que es necesaria su, este, su trabajo activo en ello. En particular también en los últimos años hemos desarrollado eh, una tecnología Hemos, en, en, mi, en, en mi gestión, en particular en el año 2019, fundamos una fábrica de nanotecnología eh, dedicada a la educación. Hacemos eh, boards de, de, para inteligencia artificial, para hacer programación de inteligencia artificial. Y con esos boards empezamos a trabajar en programas específicos para escuelas, en particular tomando en cuenta que Misiones tiene muchas reservas. Tenemos eh, selva todavía, eh, muy importante y tenemos dos vías de trabajo, una en la defensa del medio ambiente y la identificación de las especies autóctonas. Entonces estamos en un programa con 40 escuelas en las que estamos tomando una eh, eh, reserva que se llama Reserva Yabotí, cerca de los Altos del Moconá, donde estamos estableciendo periodos de tiempo de 3 a 6 meses de censado de todo el ruido de la selva. 
Entonces, con esos datos podemos nosotros entender primero la cantidad de especies animales que tenemos y la de cada uno de ellos, ver también, identificar eh, especies que por ahí se pueden considerar que están extintas o no, eh, poder censar la cantidad, por ejemplo, de tucanes, de jaguaretés o de urutaús que tenemos y también poder prevenir la caza ilegal porque en ese, esa gran cantidad de datos de, de ruido que se, que, este, que se colecta, un algoritmo va identificando eh, con este, las especies, también identifica obviamente la presencia de los humanos y el ruido de un, de un disparo. ¿no? Eso es uno de los proyectos. Y el otro proyecto que estamos haciendo junto ya con el Ministerio de eh, Ambiente de la Nación es censar eh, las emisiones de CO2 de la selva misionera. Entonces nuestras placas en particular se están instalando en diversos lugares para poder hectárea por hectárea ver específicamente cuánto es el CO2 que emite la selva misionera y de esa manera poder empezar a trabajar en la emisión de bonos eh, verdes para poder de esa manera eh, darle a un beneficio económico al cuidado de, de nuestra provincia. Si ustedes me, le, les, los invito a hacer en algún momento una búsqueda en Google y ver una foto eh, de satélite de nuestra provincia, es en el norte de Misiones entre Brasil y Paraguay, y van a ver que es prácticamente una extensión verde en medio de dos países donde tienen mucho desarrollo de cultivos. Bueno, en nuestra provincia no, y eso es un activo ambiental que entendemos que debe ser este, censado y a su vez debe eh, tener un beneficio económico para poder seguir sosteniendo la selva. ¿Y quiénes estarán a cargo de eso? Son los egresados de nuestro sistema educativo. Thank you, Minister, for two examples of how you actually manage it on the ground with interesting algorithm use and even CO2 emission measuring. Very interesting. Let me turn the floor right away to our Minister in Brazil. What are you doing on the ground for facilitating youth and green skills and green jobs? I want to talk in Spanish because it's better to think and talk. <laughs> Eh, es un placer estar acá. Yo, nosotros, eh, yo soy el ministro de Pará, de Educación, pero ha sido de San Pablo, de Amazonas, en Amazonia, y eh, ha sido el ministro de Brasil. Y por todos los eh, puntos que eh, ha estado en Brasil, lo eh, que tenemos es la educación ambiental como algo transversal. Eso está correcto. Tenemos que hacer como la transversalidad en, en la ciencia, la biología, pero también matemática, en las lenguas. Mm -hmm. Pero solamente eso también no, ha, no, no está dando cierto. Lo que estamos cambiando y haciendo por la primera vez en Brasil y, y para, eh, eh, es el primer caso que conocemos en el mundo, es hacer algo más vertical. Estamos construyendo el, el, el componente obligatorio de educación ambiental para todos los niños hasta de seis años hasta eh, el ensino medio. Porque ¿cómo vamos a hablar de empleos verdes si no tenemos el niño eh, comprendiendo, sabiendo qué son las posibilidades de, de los empleos verdes? ¿Cómo, cómo se hace para, uh, us, para dar la oportunidad uh -huh. en la Amazonia? Porque Pará es uh -huh. Amazonia, uh -huh. eh, es donde se va a ocurrir la, la COP30. Eh, están todos invitados eh, para, para estar con nosotros. Pero eh, si no, no transformarmos las generaciones eh, que están ahora de una forma urgente, no, no conseguiremos cambiar, no conseguiremos dar la oportunidad, porque el, toda la formación de los niños en el mundo está eh, a, siendo eh, para lo mismo, eh, eh, para los empleos antiguos, no para los nuevos empleos. Entonces, no hay como hacer una transformación para protección del clima, pero también para la oportunidad, porque no podemos hablar de Amazonia en Brasil. Todos aman la Amazonia, es eh, muy importante para Brasil, uh -huh. para el mundo, pero tenemos que cuidar de las personas que habitan la. Si no, si no hay oportunidad, no conseguimos. Entonces, eso es el primero, la preservación con la mudanza, con el cambio eh, eh, de la mentalidad de nuestros niños, tanto para preservar, para eh, cambiar el clima, pero también para dar oportunidad para estos eh, eh, crear y eh, 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 explorar los, eh, los empleos verdes. Thank you so much. Like, if I ask the audience who of you cares for the Amazon, I hope that all of you would raise their hands and to teach children to very much care for this region and preserve the biodiversity is absolutely of the essence. 
let me turn to a donor perspective on green jobs and green skills. Um, dear Sharon, do tell us what is your take on what can Canada contribute to the overall big field of green jobs? Thank you. Um, first, I mean, first of all, I have to say I want to thank uh, Dubai Cares for pulling this entire event together and how thrilling it is to be part of this panel and being part of this whole event. Um, I will start off actually with your question at the very beginning about mm -hmm. what is our national concern or how do we, how do we frame our work um, with the Government of Canada. We have a, na um, a feminist international assistance policy mm -hmm. and I, I know that Argentina has a feminist foreign policy as well. Um, I, I think at the core of that, our belief is that by empowering women and girls, empowering half of the, the world's population in order to devel deliver on the development, uh, on the sustainable development goals, uh, in order to uh, provide growth and access for all, I think that's, that's, that's the core of it. And it's not just girls, women, it's also about indigenous views, it's about youth, it's about um, even, you know, populations like that are that are uh, disadvantaged for example refugees it's also about a transformational approach like how can we actually move the needle it's not just about for today but it's for the longer term um, when it comes to uh, so getting back to your question about what is what is Canada doing or what is the donor perspective with with perspective particularly to education mm -hmm. uh, we certainly see that as a catalyst as a driver as a um, foundational to the achievement of all the SDGs and a key contributor to uh, sustainable economic development and green jobs. I would also say I was um, struck by the comments in the previous session, the, at the beginning session, um, by distinguished uh, Jeffrey Sachs and the sort of economic point of view. Canada also has, I would say, at, a, um, at, the, at the national level, a way of measuring progress that is not just about economic growth. It's not just about um, you know numbers and GDP. We have a, a well-being approach that takes into consideration inclusion. It takes into consideration poverty. It, takes, it even has a longer-term approach. It's not just what happens today, mm -hmm. but it also is what happens. Like you have to look at what is the longer-term uh, impact of things. Again, women and girls, uh, education, many many different a aspects, and that helps to inform what we do abroad, including in education. Um, I could go on, but maybe I'll... I'll <laughs> <laughs> it is fascinating to hear what Canada manages already, and particularly also, you can probably lend some lessons learned to other countries with what you have already managed to put into place when it comes to support of women and girls in matters of climate education. So thank you for that. I do happen to know that Plan International, here represented by Kathleen next to me, has done an extensive study on youth in green skills. And I would like to know, Kathleen, from your perspective, <coughs> what is most necessary for education and skills? What, what does youth need to do? What do we need to do for youth? Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. And again, also big thanks to Dubai Cares for Day. Before I get to the survey, I mean, I think part of that mm -hmm. first question you were asking is, look, climate change is a gender issue, it's an intergenerational issue, uh, it's a social issue, and it's an economic justice issue, right? It's not just one thing. 99% of all the world's children have already experienced a direct climate event shock or stressor, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So this is something that young people are not just living with today for the rest of their very, very long lives. Now, in terms of, as we think about this transition to green jobs, we then have an ability to be also to address both um, climate, but also to protect the environment, gender equality. We can address the journey of international um, in intergenerational equity, and of course, a million of jobs. Um, plan uh, had a survey. We had over 2,000 young people, adolescents and youth from over 50 countries. About 60% were uh, girls and young women. And we asked them, what do you need, you know, in terms of how do you feel? Do you feel um, ready and prepared for green jobs and skills? Um, and uh, are you able to participate? Do you feel well equipped? Mm -hmm. Do you even understand the opportunities? Um, and the sad outcome of that survey, uh, though important, is only 30% felt that they had the right skills. They thought they mm -hmm. had the right skills to tackle 
um, the green uh, economy and also green jobs. So there's a lot of um, space there. <laughs> um, and one of their key concerns is they had said a couple things. One is 95% of the young people surveyed said they had already experienced uh, direct climate events wow. themselves. So, th mm -hmm. so that links up. Um, and again, about 95% also said that this was their number one concern. So some of the key recommendations that came out of the study um, that would be Im important to note um, is first, there's a number of clear solutions. The first is investing in gender transformative education. Um, and to look at how to address accessing green jobs. So there's a couple sort of key skills that we need to focus on. So the first is around general skills, adaptability, um, resilience and flexibility. The second is the technical skills, right? So that's STEM and that's research and that's business and that's finance. And the third is um, really transformational skills. And I think Sharon, you mentioned this, it's valuing indigenous experience and heritage, it's collective action, it's advocacy. 91% of young people say that they don't know how to influence climate policy. Now, perhaps the 9% nine, 9 are here mm -hmm. at COP today, um, but that's a huge gap. So when we go to look at sort of practical um, things that we can do, that's both in terms of looking at um, fully paid internships, mm -hmm. that's looking at training and learning opportunities, that's looking at equal access to green jobs, that's investing in policy and advocacy and influencing and having youth-centered advocacy. And obviously, it's a course It's ensuring that young people have direct access to finance. So I'll stop there. But again, Brilliant. there's a number of direct solutions. But I think that that number is only 30% of young mm -hmm. people feel equipped mm -hmm. to access this very important green job market. This is the perfect segue to listen to Latifa. She is a representative, a younger representative. 95%, you said, Kathleen, mm. actually yeah. feel that they are climate concerned and yet only 30 are equipped. I'm interested in your vantage point on what needs to be done. Yes, so um, can I, okay, I'll turn to you guys first. Can I see a raise of hands if you've heard the term youth are the future? <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody has heard that too. And yes, while I do agree we are the future, we're also the present. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly why I'm here, to represent global youth and show us that, uh, show you that if you just allow us to contribute, uh, you can just sit back and watch as we pave the way for a more sustainable future where green jobs are the foundation of our economy. And that's why I'd like to thank uh, the Ban Ki-moon Center for having a youth representative here to voice our concerns and to voice what we think should happen and how we should be involved um, in the pathway towards a greener economy. Thank you so much. I have a challenge for the panelists now because we do another round and yet I want to pose two questions mm -hmm. to you and you can pick and choose which mm -hmm. one you want. One question that comes up quite a bit when it comes to green jobs is how can we prevent greenwashing? So that companies or someone else is supporting green jobs and green labor, but actually it's a greenwashing exercise. That's one question that I would love to get your insights on. And another one that I would love to get your insights on is actually, can you tell me one challenge that you faced in your respective field where you found an excellent solution that others could emulate? So either the challenge question or the greenwashing question. And it's free for you to choose who wants to start, anyone. Yeah, bueno, bueno el, el, creo que el mayor desafío que tenemos nosotros en particular como Estado subnacional es el de ser eh, custodios del medio ambiente y por eso se ha tomado una acción política. Uh -huh. el, la provincia de Misiones es la primera provincia del país que tiene un ministerio de cambio climático. Eh, tiene eh, un ministerio de ecología que se encarga de las cuestiones operativas, y un Ministerio de Cambio Climático que se encarga de la planificación uh -huh. de la protección del medio ambiente. Uh -huh. Esto tomando en cuenta los recursos naturales con los que cuenta la provincia, no solamente la selva misionera, la biodiversidad, sino que también que está en el centro del acuífero guaraní, que es la mayor reserva de agua dulce de América Latina. Uh -huh. Por lo tanto, esas dos cuestiones que son, eh, digamos, naturales, son responsabilidad directa del gobierno de la provincia y de esa manera lo ha tomado, por eso hay acciones directas y se inician siempre desde la educación. Como te decía, la única manera que entendimos nosotros de poder eh, 
sostener una política de, eso, de, 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 de inversión de recursos en el futuro del medio ambiente, la custodia del medio ambiente, que tal vez para un gobierno no tiene una, un, digamos, un, eh, un resultado cierto, directo o a corto plazo, eh, tiene que ser justificado por la idea de que sí existe la, la necesidad de que alguien lo haga. Y en este caso ha sido el gobierno nuestro, eh, digamos de la provincia desde hace más de 20 años, y en particular el Ministerio de Educación ha tomado esto como una bandera y por eso lo estamos haciendo. Thank you very much. Highly interesting. Who who else has uh, like some examples for for how it is actually implemented? Yeah, yeah maybe sure. Karine. Yeah. Well, I'll go to the survey and and yeah. I, I love the comments that young people, as I always say, are leading today. They're not the leaders of the future; the leaders yeah. of today. So, going back to you know plan study, one of the you know there's several barriers mm -hmm. sort of brought up in the survey. So the first was of course lack to s lack of startup startup capital or seed funding. Um, the second was, of course, lack of um, training yeah. um, and education. Um, and then the third was just lack of awareness, not understanding mm -hmm. sort of where those opportunities are. And the number one solution posed, again, this is 2,000 young people over 50 countries, um, was to really reform the current education system, that mm -hmm. you know there needed to be more focus on sharpening sort of this critical perspective of potential solutions for climate change. And what was is missing in education is the intersectional approach. How does climate you know, connect to policy or law or economics or finance or business um, and to uh, geography and not to contain it mm -hmm. um, in its own issues? So I think for the um, Ministry of Education staff and, and ministers uh, here today, this is sort of a very key sort of point that came through um, the study. Um, and the urgency, you know, is as we know that women and young people are already widely excluded from the economic environment, right? Mm -hmm. And what scares me, and one of the outcomes of the survey, is that we're seeing that translate into the green job economy already. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really important that there is that emphasis on gender transformative climate education but also bringing in that intersectional approach. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the intersectionality. Very important. Yeah, I do see Sharon, please. Yes, thanks. I'm going to take the kind of tough question about how to make sure that it's not just greenwashing. Thank mm -hmm. you. And Go for um, it. I would say there's a couple of things. First of all is a multi-stakeholder approach. Mm -hmm. Of course, of course, we need um, private sector in there. If if uh, if they're not in there, it's uh, you know all the change that others will want to happen maybe won't happen unless they're unless they're actively engaged and they're actually doing something mm -hmm. about it. We we need we need governance governments. We need youth organizations. We need um, we need all sectors of society. Obviously, we need we need teachers. We need schools. We need communities. Um, so what I would say though is that. What's ne what needs to happen is really giving voice and agency to those people who are uh, impacted by global decision making mm -hmm. and not just, not just those who are sort of in charge and make sure that they have an opportunity to inform and to co-create uh, solutions. I have to say that one of the things that I'm proudest of, I'm actually pretty new in my job, but um, mm -hmm. one of the things that I'm proudest of is that Canada is one of the biggest supporters of women's rights organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, and we uh, also support a lot of youth organizations. Uh, we bring their voices uh, at the community level, at the, at the, at the subnational and national level, um, and then even at the multilateral level. Uh, I was very pleased. One of the first things that I did in my job was go to the uh, to UNGA meetings where uh, we had generation equality there. Mm -hmm. They had a fantastic youth panel that was speaking to the entire room, uh, bringing their voices, bringing their uh, concerns, and really making sure that um, that we are going back to the point that was made by the minister before about changing mindsets. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, that's really critical. One of the things that comes to mind there is around, in the past, there was this mindset that either you had growth and you know jobs uh, that you know yes that and, and this mindset was that well you know the 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 environment that that was just a sort of a, a collateral damage in having growth and i think the the mindset now is that growth and sustainability really has to go together yeah 
Okay, it's not an either or. Latifa, please. Yes, um, I'll take the question about greenwashing too. And I think the first step we have to do is define what a green job is. Hmm. There's a lot of back and forth. People don't really know how to define what a green job is. Hmm. In fact, the International Labour Organization defines it as any decent mm -hmm. job that contributes to solving the climate crisis. And that definition is definitely a double-edged sword. On one end, uh, it shows the broad view of uh, green jobs. It shows that it's not just renewable energy systems. It's green infrastructure. It's sustainable agriculture. Um, it's the lawyers and policymakers behind policy-driven climate action. But on the other hand, it opens the door to greenwashing. Any company can just label a job as green, mm -hmm. uh, even if they could care less about the planet. And so the first step, I think, is having a concrete definition to avoid um, greenwashing while still keeping the broad scope of green jobs in a green economy. I like that statement a lot, Latifa, and I challenge you mm -hmm. even further mm -hmm. because you told me about an example to a challenge that you had, and I want you to talk about it. So I think Slovakia is the key yes. word here. Please. Um, so uh, when we talk about fossil fuel phase-outs, we can't talk about it unless we also talk about a just transition. Uh, we can't expect fossil fuel-dependent economies and countries to survive without it being through a just transition. And um, this includes the reskilling and upskilling of workers um, in, in the fossil fuel industry. And as Monica mentioned, um, Slovakia is a great example. Uh, by the end of this month, they're set to close the last coal mine in Slovakia. And so, you know, you have these thousands of workers, of coal mine workers, what are they going to do? Are they just supposed to lose their jobs and their livelihoods? No, that would not be a sustainable transition. It would not be fair to them. So what Slovakia is doing is that they're investing um, in the reskilling and upskilling of all of these coal workers to transfer them to greener jobs so that um, they're not lost, their livelihoods aren't lost, and the countries pursue to a more climate resilient economy. Thank you, Latifa. Your Excellency. Greenwashing. ¿Qué es eso para los niños? ¿Qué es eso para para nosotros, para la sociedad? Nosotros no sabemos. ¿Cómo vamos a cambiar la transformación que queremos para combatir el greenwash y tener la posición si no si no acertamos con la generación que está en las escuelas? Por eso yo quiero volver que eh, para mí el grande que dice que podemos hacer una gran transformación es eh, eh, cómo comunicar con los niños, cómo hacer eso uh, uh, desde muy eh, eh, pequeños, con los seis años, cinco años, cuatro años. Uh, uh, eh, nosotros tenemos que empezar desde cedo para eso. Por eso eh, yo creo que el, el camino de la educación ambiental como algo más vertical dentro, no solamente con transversal, eh, insisto, es eh, el principal, eh, para que podamos cambiar. Estamos hablando de, de Amazonia. En Amazonia tenemos eh, la cultura indígena, que uh -huh. es muy importante para nosotros, y todo el conocimiento que tenemos de la medicina eh, eh, con los indígenas, de, de nuestra comida, que es maravillosa, pueden uh -huh. probar en copia, eh, 30, en, sí, 25, es, es maravillosa. Pero nos, eh, eh, se va a comer azaí, acá, no es lo mismo que está viendo de la Amazonia, eh, no, está, está cambiado por un proceso industrial uh -huh. para a, llegar acá. Pero los niños no saben la posibilidad que tenemos, eh, con, con que tenemos en la Amazonia para, para mostrar. La educación puede cambiar para el conocimiento, las skills uh -huh. Uh -huh. Eh, que, que ha sido hablado, para que el joven pueda hacer la, pueda hacer la transformación Ahora, no en el futuro, como ha dicho por la TIFA, sí, tienes que ser ahora, pero tienes que ser ahora con los niños. Eh, nosotros estamos defendiendo la COPI en 24, eh, hacer algo para los niños y los jóvenes en Brasil, en Belén, están todos invitados, nosotros estamos eh, eh, trayendo eh, eh, esto para el debate también, porque tenemos que poner la juventud a frente de, de la solución pero tenemos que darle conocimiento para eso, eh, conectar con la realidad. En Brasil, las escuelas no están conectadas con la realidad, están distantes. Mm -hmm. Creo que eso es un problema en el mundo también, ¿no? porque hablamos de greenwashing, hablamos de la sostenibilidad, de los empleos verdes, mm -hmm. pero no hablamos sobre eso con los niños. Estamos hablando de los, de lo viejo, de los viejos empleos. Estamos, mm -hmm. eh, eh, tenemos que cambiar la mentalidad de cómo trabajamos desde cedo para que la gener uh, esta generación de jóvenes eh, eh, sea la transformación. Eh, creo que ese es el camino para, 
combater el greenwash, eh, eh, conocer, conocer con los niños, sí. conociendo, mm. le, le van a cambiar. Mm. Thank you very much. Yeah, good insight. Mm. We do have a couple of minutes left only, but I do want to present to the audience one chance where all of you can engage into green jobs and actually into a green future. I want to use this moment to launch the online course that the Ban Ki-moon Center has co-developed with, of course, <laughs> Dubai Cares and with the help of Plan International and Unbounded Associates. It is your future in green jobs, and I want you to check it out. We have a video for you. Are you a passionate individual who wants to make a difference in the world? Are you ready to tackle problems our world is facing? Do you want a career that aligns with your concerns for the environment? Look no further. Welcome to our online course, Your Future in Green Jobs. Find your green career pathway. Module one, spot the challenge. It will jumpstart your exploration into the world of green jobs and green careers. And it will connect you <coughs> to the overall concept of the Sustainable Development Goals. You will reflect on which skills you possess and which abilities you would like to develop. You will also share your thoughts on green skills with other learners in the course. You will attend a virtual green job career fair and be introduced to the many career paths open to you across various sectors. You will be introduced to the work of green entrepreneurs around the world and how their work aligns with their values while contributing to sustainable development. Finally, you will connect green jobs to broader systems change and link them to the SDGs and climate action. By choosing a green career, you can follow your values and find meaning in your work every day. You can play an important role in solving this crisis. We hope that you will finish the course feeling confident and excited. We also hope you will continue your journey and find the right green career path for you. We hope this will help you to find your pathway to be part of the solution. Your work will be greener. Your life will be greener. And your future will be greener. So, if you want to take that course or let others know that this exists, please check out a QR code that comes up now on the slide that you can scan. And indeed, please be part of our journey. We have promised 10,000 subscribers in the first couple of months. So I do <coughs> insist that all of you become our ambassadors, <laughs> that we have the 10,000 subscribers in the first couple of months. Thank you. The course is in English, but we do hope for other languages soon enough, and mm -hmm. it's very interactive, and particularly targeted at those 14 to 20-year-olds that need inspiration. How mm -hmm. can I contribute? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if Tarek al Gurk, His Excellency, is with us already. He's not here. He's not here. So we will have a closing that is different from what we expected, and the closing will be all of us. And it will be with one word each, or one sentence each. I give you one <laughs> sentence of what do you think should a green job of the future look like? What is your take? Who wants to go first? One sentence or one word? Can yes. go first? Yes. Um, Okay, two words with a hyphen, youth-centric. Youth-centric, mm -hmm. thank you very much, wonderful. What else should a green job of the future be like? Built on your passion. Built on your passion, beautiful sentence. Como vida para todos. Vida para todos, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. La casa es de todos. La casa es de todos, wonderful. Gender transformative. Gender transformative. I say, it should be all of us. Mm -hmm. It should be you, it should be me, it should be all of us. Thank you very much for this session. Round of yeah, applause for the you. panelists. <laughs> we ended more or less in time. time. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you.